The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He replied, What do you wish me to do for you? They answered him, Grant that in your glory we may sit, one at your right and the other at your left. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. You drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. They said to him, We can. Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right and my left is not mine to give, but it is only for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at James and John. Jesus summoned them and said to them, You know that those who are Gentiles are recognized as rulers over the Gentiles, and they lord it over them, and their great ones make their authority over them felt. Rather, it shall not be among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Father James Moore, and I'm the Vicar Provincial for Advancement for the Dominicans here in the West. But it's a great joy for me to return here to San Francisco and to preach this novena for the Shrine of St. Jude. I'm the former St. Jude director, uh, pre- uh, predecessor to my classmate, Father Dismas. It gives me great joy to uh, be here with you all today to preach. Um, also, if you do not know anything about the Shrine of St. Jude today, after Mass, a very quick little presentation will be given at the Shrine by Merle over here. It lasts about 20 minutes if you'd like to hear some of the history and the um, opportunities to serve here with the Shrine of St. Jude. Brothers and sisters, I've been a priest for about ten and a half years now, and the vast majority of that time has been spent working in ministry with, well, those who are younger than me. First, these were college students, and then here at St. Dominic's, interacting especially with so many of the young adults. Now, being a member of Generation X, I was always wondering, is a spiritual life like for those who are younger than me? Now, 10 years ago, when I first became a priest, I heard a lot of this. Maybe you've heard this before. I'm sure Father Michael has heard this before. Father, you know, I'm really more spiritual than religious. You've heard this, right? I'm more spiritual than religious. Sure, I believe in God. I maybe even believe in what the church teaches. Maybe even believe that Jesus is God. Sure, that's all fine. But I don't see any reason for me to pray every day. I don't see any reason for me to go to Mass every Sunday. Certainly don't see a reason to go to confession on a regular basis. I believe in God, but I only go to him when I really need him. Otherwise, he's kind of not on my mind. Spiritual, but not religious. That was 10 years ago. However, wanting to figure out what do people think now, especially our young friends now, I turned to Bishop Robert Barron, who is one of the greatest evangelists in our country today. Bishop Barron turned me towards a book called iGen. iGen is written by a sociologist talking about the generation today, the generation after the millennials, which is the generation after me. People in iGen were born in 1995 and after. And it's called iGen because it's the Internet generation. 1995 was the year that the Internet became widespread in most American homes. And this is the first generation to come of age holding one of these devices in their hands, right? iGen. Ten years ago, we heard spiritual but not religious. What about this generation? Oftentimes, Father, I'm neither spiritual or religious. Kind of the logical outcome, but spiritual but not religious, right? I'm neither spiritual or religious. I don't even know if there is a God and it wouldn't have much of a bearing on my day-to-day life anyway. That's a real problem, right, brothers and sisters? It's really, really sad. 
This book also went on to talk about some more secular things. This generation, new generation, often fearful. They've been raised by helicopter parents. And for them, their greatest concern, their greatest virtue is not courage, not daring, safety. Safety. This generation is often depressed at a higher rate. They're filled with anxiety. And a very disturbing trend is their rates of suicide are higher. This generation is radically individualistic. They do not want to belong to any group that has an authority structure over it. And finally, this generation, which is filled with anxiety, despite having constant connectivity to the rest of the world with their cell phones, are incredibly lonely. Incredibly lonely. This generation would often rather stay in their rooms and stay on their phones than interact with real people. They often have lost the ability to have real relationships. They instead have relationships on social media. And brothers and sisters, you can have a real relationship with an Instagram account, right? That is an idealized version of something else. That's an idealized picture of something else. You cannot have a real uh, relationship with that. You can only have a real relationship with a person. With a person. I've also discovered that loneliness is a plague here in San Francisco in general, not just among the young. The populace here tells me, from those who are homeless to those who live in great mansions in Pacific Heights, that they're often surrounded by people but have no real relationships with them. Surrounded by many but connected to none. Loneliness. The city is filled with people who are often displaced and disconnected. So what can we do then, brothers and sisters? Well, I think in the natural realm, many things, right? However, I want to talk about what we can do from our faith life. What faith life can have to say with regard to loneliness. How we can bring Christ into the middle of this plague. Now you might say, okay, well, Father James, all you have to do then is get these people to come to church, right? We have a great community here. Just come to church, right? Well, easier said than done. We bring up the church on the street. What do people often think of now? Scandal, right? Division. Problems. They often say, look at this. The church is filled, including her leaders, with sinners. The church is filled with people who are hypocrites. Well, that's kind of what the point of the church is, right? The church is not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners, right? The church is a place that is filled with sinners, but the difference is it ought to be sinners who want to become saints. And whatever means the Lord uses to do this, and right now seeming to use the government and the court of public opinion as a scourge to purify the church, especially her leadership and the hierarchy. But we see in today's gospel this is kind of always how it's been, right? Look at this gospel today. I mean, here we see James and John, right? Two of the leadership appointed by Jesus Christ, two of the first bishops of the church, the first priests of the church. And what do they do? They're a total mess. They ask to sit at Jesus' right and left in glory, more concerned about worldly power and lording it over others than the life of service, than the life of the cross the life of martyrdom, which each and every priest ought to be ready to give his life for. This shows us that the church has never been this country club for saints, but indeed always a community of sinners, but sinners who, God willing, can become saints. So then we do have some wonderful helps from God himself to help heal this problem of loneliness. And most of them have to do, brothers and sisters, with friendship. True friendship. Not a friendship based on power. Not a friendship based on the internet or some sort of imaginary or some sort of virtual connectivity, but real friendship. Friendship between Christian friends. Friendship within the church. And the necessity of this church, despite how sinful she may be, but not only that, we have friends not only in the church militant here on earth, we have friends in the church triumphant in heaven. That is the saints. 
And we can have friends, be friends with them. Friends on earth and friends above. Particular friends above. Especially here in the shrine of St. Jude and St. Dominic's Church, we honor St. Jude, that powerful patron. The patron who kind of works behind the scenes often. Our friend who often will be in the shadows and come in and help us. And of course, the greatest friend amongst the saints, our blessed mother, our lady of the rosary, who pulls us along sometimes whether we want to get to heaven or not. And then the greatest type of friendship, friendship with God himself. The philosopher Aristotle says that the greatest happiness consists of friendship. St. Thomas Aquinas then takes this a little bit further and says, yes, this greatest friendship is friendship with God himself. So how then, brothers and sisters, do we become the friends of God? How do we let our Lord to come in and help soothe our loneliness and help move out so that we can be the joyful saints we are called to be? Well, I'm covering these various topics I just mentioned above throughout this novena to help us deal with our loneliness. But even more importantly, to help orient us more towards heaven. We realize we are not created to be alone. We are created for each other. And ultimately, oriented towards the love of God, which means getting to heaven to become saints. And what else is a saint but a friend of God? Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever.